Uh, this week, I'm going to talk about skiing. Next week, the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to have a slide presentation on what you heard of today. And we're going to talk about and have slides on the earliest days of skiing in the Gunnison country, going back to 1880 in Crested Butte, and work right on up through the present Crested Butte ski area. So we'll have a slideshow at the start of the session next time. Uh, Flowshank, I got a slideshow on April 1 at the Talk of the Town, and then the big dance is April the 3rd with Pete Dunda, also at, I guess, at Maxwell's. Correct? Yeah. Maxwell's, thank you. Now, on the polkas, uh, we have gone to the tapes, <laughs> and everybody has been given a grade. <laughs> Nobody hit 10. <laughs> But there were some, uh, some pretty good grades. So if anybody wants to uh, find out, I'm just kidding. We are, I haven't looked at the tape yet. OK, enough, enough said. Let's, let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, if there was ever a place in the United States or even around the world that was made for skiing, it probably was Crested Butte. High elevation, champagne powder, tremendous terrain, and one of the great histories of skiing very early. I've been to Chamonix, France, and uh, there's, uh, you know, there's no way I'd be skiing some of those places because you've got to walk on those damn steel ladders to get to them. And I'm not about to do that, but it reminds me a lot of Crested Butte. When one thinks of the state of Colorado and the Rockies, you always think of snow and skiing. I always tell my classes that, uh, that that's kind of a misnomer. When you think of Alaska, everybody says Eskimos and ice. When you think about Texas, they say cows and loudmouths. When you think about California, you think of the Beach Boys and good-looking blonde women with straight blonde hair in the back. And when you think of Colorado, you think of the Rockies and skiing. But the eastern one-third of Colorado might as well be the western part of Nebraska, because one-third of the state is flat. Now, here we are. We are right now about nine days away from springtime in the Rockies. As I start out with skiing today, in the 1930s, a guy named Nelson Eddy and a great girl named Jeanette McDonald started a movie called Rosemary. And they're both heartthrobs, and Nelson Eddy played a member of the Canadian Mounted Police in Banff, Canada. And Jeanette McDonald was a gorgeous blonde who Nelson Eddy was trying to land. Now, I want all you women to pay attention as I give you the words now to springtime in the Rockies that Nelson Eddy was crooning to Jeanette McDonald. Nobody knows how these things happen. Because as Nelson Eddy began to croon to Jeanette McDonald, a damn band appeared in the, in the background. And it goes something like this. The twilight shadows deepen in the night, dear. The city lights are gleaming o'er the snow. I sit alone beside the cheery fire, dear, dreaming dreams from out the long ago. I fancy it is springtime in the mountains. The flowers with their colors are aflame. And every day I hear you softly saying, I'll wait until the springtime comes again. And then that damn band appeared and played the chorus. When it's springtime in the Rockies, I am coming back to you, little sweetheart of the mountains, with your bonny eyes of blue. Once again, I'll say I love you, while the birds sing all the day, when it's springtime in the Rockies, and the Rockies far away. Jeanette McDonald turned into a bucket of mush. <laughs> let this be a warning to all you women. Don't let those guys start crooning some damn words like springtime in the Rockies. If Nelson Eddy had been an honorable man, this is what he would have said. When it's springtime in the Rockies and it's 99 below, the Eskimos go barefoot in the white and drifting snow. The polar bears get sunburned while the seals sing all the day. When it's springtime in the Rockies, I'll be drifting the other way. 
When it's springtime in the Rockies and the blue snow settles in, the beaver knows precisely that the winter's blowing in. The tourists, they get hoodwinked by the sky so clearly blue. When it's springtime in the Rockies, I'll soon be leaving you. <laughs> There's people in this room that are going to Cancun, Phoenix, and areas to the south during mud season. There's no such thing as springtime in the Rockies. The damn thing doesn't exist. It's mud season, and everybody gets out of Dodge. Skiing in the Gunnison country in the early days was tough and dangerous. High elevation, heavy snow, numbing cold, the vertical of the mountains, and I don't know how many people died in avalanches, but as I went through the newspapers and have gone through the newspapers at least 10 a year, Guys skiing out of uh, the Augusta mine at Pittsburgh, six of them wiped out at one time trying to come into Crested Butte. Avalanche just coming off a of Tin Cup Pass, Cumberland Pass, Schofield Pass, all over the place. Anybody ever has gone over Schofield Pass and you go by Emerald Lake, I think vomits avalanches. And then you go through the Crystal Canyon and that thing vomits avalanches. Hell, they had an avalanche on W Mountain about two, three weeks ago. You never know when they're going to hit, and they hit often. The earliest skiing in the Gunnison country came from early day ministers, and there are three of them that come to mind. One of them was a guy named John Franklin Darley, who was a Methodist missionary. His Methodist church still stands in Breckenridge, and he skied from Breckenridge to the north end of Taylor Park over Lake Pass, came to Spring Creek, worked his way up Dead Man's Gulch, ran into Cement Creek, and from Cement Creek ran to where Crested Butte is today, and seven miles up Washington Gulch, he came to a camp called Minersville, 250 placer miners in the year 1861. Later on, Father Dyer wrote a great book called The Snowshoe Itinerant. Traveling on skis in the winter, horse in the summer, with a Bible and mail and supplies. Another guy was Father George Darley, Presbyterian missionary, Lake City. Go to Lake City today, that Presbyterian church there is 1877, the oldest church on the western slope of Colorado. Father Darley skied over Engineer Pass and Cinnamon Pass in the wintertime down into Silverton and Animus Forks and other San Juan towns. And later on, would write a great work about it called Pioneering in the San Juan, 1870s. And the last guy was a fellow by the name of Father John J. Gibbon, a Catholic, Telluride. And Father Gibbon later on wrote a great work called Sketches in the San Juan. We got all those in our library. If you want to read some great early stuff of the Gunnison country and the Lake City area, read those guys. 11 foot long skis, guide pole, 50 pound pack on his back, Bible. Those guys are lone figures coming into the mining camps. One newspaper said this, the carrier in the frontier of the Rockies straps the mail sack, on his, mail sack on his back, puts on his Norwegian snowshoes, snowshoes at that time are skis, and with a long guiding pole starts on his way. A weary climb over the divide. Usually there's a crowd at the post office to wish him good luck. Only men of known strength and courage do this work. For 25 to 50 pounds on your back becomes very heavy in climbing mountains. Out of the days of yesteryear he comes and every eye in the camp is peeled on him as he flies off the top of the divide. With his scarf flailing in the breeze and his telemark turns carving beautifully into the snow, he dodges trees with the beady eyes of one who has done it often. They know how to write in those days. And they may have taken a liberty or two. I don't know about the scarf waving and the beautifully carved telemark turns and all of that kind of stuff. Tom Brokaw wasn't around to record it. 
Then came the great silver rush in the Gunnison country. These guys are around during the Placer miners. And then the big silver boom hits in the middle 1870s. 25 to 40,000 people, as I told you last time, flocked in from 1879 to 1882. The big silver camps, Pitkin, Gothic, Tin Cup, White Pine, Irwin, the big five, but there were 50 to 75 others. Many of the people who came into the mining camps came from Scandinavia. They were Danes and Swedes and Norwegians and Finns. And other guys like Alan Fred Johnson came from French Quebec, Canada, where they had skied in the San Laurentian Mountains. They skied on what today we would call snowshoes. So a ski then was called a snowshoe. A snowshoe today was then called Canadian webs. Canadian webs were useless because they said the snow was so dry that you just sink in too much. So they had to use skis. Harry Cornwall, the guy, the mining engineer from Irwin who left us a great memoir said this, everything that we ate was packed on man, men's backs from tea chowds. That's up Ohio Creek. All traveling was on snowshoes. There were a few men who packed for hire. The tariff was 15 to 20 cents a pound, but it was man-killing work, especially as those professionals carried 100 pounds on their backs from tea chowds over Ohio Pass at 10,033 feet and on into Irwin. We never carried more than 50 pounds. Packing a load while walking on foot on a good trail is not to be compared with the same load while skiing and climbing up over a mountain pass about 2,000 feet up. Very few men lasted more than a month at this professional packing, making one round trip a day, 20 miles each way. 100 pounds in, 20 miles in, 20 miles out. 40 miles one day, back and forth over Ohio Pass. Cornwall also said, all travel except from cabin to cabin in Irwin was on snowshoes. We sent east for several pair of regular Canadian web shoes, but they were useless. The Colorado snow was so light and feathery that wearing these shoes, we sank below our knees and travel was impossible. Skis were imperative and we were all busy making them. Fire-killed spruce timber was used. Fortunately, there were a few carpenters in camp, and by wrapping the toes of the skis in burlap and boiling them in our largest camp kettles, we were able to make a pretty good bend for the toes. Now, the average ski in the Gunnison country was 9 to 14 feet, and I've seen some 14-footers. So just imagine that here's the back end of the ski here. We got 3 feet, 6 feet, 9 feet, 11 feet is the average. 14 feet is the longest. Now we got a lot of hot shot skiers today, but I'd like to see them on 14 foot long skis with somebody saying, plant the pole, bend the knees and turn. You might turn, but the skis would be rocketing right down the hill. So a little bit about the skis. 11 to 14 feet long, four and a half inches wide, often during a short time, there were ski trails between Irwin and Crested Butte. The reason for the long length of the western ski, and I'm quoting, was that it was hard to give a ski a limber nose to handle bumps at high speed. If it was shorter, it would break. The only way to get a good ride in the 1880s was to lengthen the ski. So here you are in the skis, you got your uh, mountain boots on, your miner's boots on, and you put him into a leather toe piece. On the back of your heel is a four inch heel block. Heel can come up, but it keeps it from going back. The width of the ski under the foot for about a foot is three and a half inches. The width of the ski at the toe and the back is three eighths of an inch. And now you got a seven foot long guide pole. And the only way you can turn 
is by a telemark turn, which they describe as lunging forward, swinging the pole around, and turning. Now, in reality, not very many people turned a lot. You can imagine trying to turn skis, and incidentally, the weight was eight pounds. Four pounds on the left ski, four pounds on the right ski. The size of the skis resembled two logs under the skiers, one guy said. <clears throat> skis were halted when you fell from going to oblivion by lanyards attached to the ski. So while you're skiing, you got these lanyards attached to your pockets or whatever, and if you fall, remember the old safety straps who used to have the long thongs? You got the idea. Even the trusty telemark turn did not always work. And to avoid crashing into boulders or trees, a skier often leaped off his skis into over-the-head snow. Sunburn was another major problem for early-day skiers especially in the spring when the bright sun reflected off the snow. Quote, even well-tanned miners burn so badly that their noses and lips cracked open. Harry Cornwall recalled, we finally painted our faces with gunpowder and water before a day in the sun. Smoked glasses were necessary all winter. Something passing for sunglasses, but doubly necessary in the spring to prevent snow blindness. The sport of skiing was not for the faint of heart. One miner in the Gunnison country recalled, quote, I would say to those who are about to make their first attempt at riding shoes that one great quality to possess is confidence. They must at least feel some security. What is needed is conceit. A little of this gives one courage and smooths the way to success. Um, is trying to get to the right line here. Uh, one of the top skiers in the Gunnison country advised beginners to ride low on their skis or assume a squatting position and to, quote, hold the pole in the right hand and going over a jump, which is occasioned at, at times by a tree lying across the track. This will, when a snowshoeist is going fast, make considerable lift of both shoes and rider, and sometimes the shoes go on their course alone while the rider is making strange, tigratory motions in the air. Now, I told you last time about the stovepipe story in Irwin, right? We all got that one. I told you the story about Nellie Bly last time. The newspaper reporter from New York. I told you about that one. I told you the story about Louis Barthel, the snowshoe carrier between Crested Butte and Gothic, carrying in one hip boot at a time after being forced to carry in a 50-gallon can of coal oil. In the early 1880s, when the mining camps were booming, Al Johnson and his brother Fred came to Crystal, 1879. <clears throat> Al Johnson went on to become the leading citizen of Crystal from 1880 to 1892. He was the postmaster, he owned a general store, he had interest in three mines, and he was the man about town. He and his brother were Canadians who had learned to ski very early in the San Laurentian Mountains. So he's already skilled before he got here. They had skied in races in the San Laurentian Mountains, and now, they got the contract to take the mail between Crested Butte and Crystal. The distance, 24 miles, very dangerous. <clears throat> now, I have skied with Josh Thompson, who's an Olympic skier, three times, and Andrew Edstrom, who was the son of Neil Edstrom, the Snow Ranger, uh, four times from Crested Butte into Marble. And you know, we always skied in the spring of the year cross-country skis, and one place I was happy to get through was Emerald Lake because there's no trees on the right side of Emerald Lake. I mean, it's just avalanche area, but it was set up. And the problem in going into the Crystal Canyon is not so much the steepness, but when the wind blows that snow in, it blows it in at an angle. And if you've ever tried to hold an edge on cross-country skis, 
it's a little difficult. And that's the, that is what Al Johnson had to do and his brother Fred, winter and summer. Ski racing started in the Gunnison country during the winter of 1880 and 81. As Harry Cornwall would say, during that first winter, 79 and 80, everybody was so busy that they didn't have time for skiing, racing, I mean, they had skis. Cross-country racing was not even considered, quote, because we had so much of the latter to do in business, it didn't appeal to us. They were always cross-country skiing. Why have a cross-country race? John E. Phillips, the editor of the Elk Mountain Pilot in Irwin said, if a man didn't know how to ski, he just had to stay home all winter. Irwin, Gothic, Tin Cup, and dozens of other camps depended for several months each winter upon snowshoes and skis to bring in their mail and get their food and clothing. Racing clubs began in the early 1880s, first in Colorado, racing clubs, and one of the first examples of a racing club in the West. Gothic, Tin Cup, and dozens of other camps were involved in the races. The early races had people organizing them in Gothic, Irwin, Tin Cup, Crystal, Marble, and Gunnison. And everybody had their champions. And every Saturday, everybody would get together at a different spot, one of the different towns, and they would hold races, downhill races, with good prizes and a lot of betting on the races. Now, when I say good prizes, in the great race I'm going to tell you about with Al Johnson and Charlie Benny, 20 bucks first prize. You couldn't make 20 a week mining if you're working for wages. You're, you're talking, you know, about three, four dollars a day. Ten bucks second prize, five bucks for third prize. Phillips said that the favorite ski and toboggan course in Crested Butte, quote, was the hillside just south of the town of Crested Butte where the buildings of the CF&I coal mines now stand. That's Gibson Ridge and Baxter Basin. The races were always exciting and dangerous. But there was never any serious accidents. Dr. Rockefeller, an expert skier, was always on hand for problems. Phillips continued, in the early 80s when Irwin boomed, young people got out often for a snowshoe run. The runway was in front of the Elk Mound pilot office. They would climb the hill for the sport of gliding down. If they got to the bottom, all right, but more often the shoes would turn and down they would go. Now remember, you're not skiing on groomed runs. I mean, every kind of possible condition could exist. Phillips continued, if residents of Urban wanted to come to the big town, Crested Butte, they had to come on skis, and it was not an uncommon sight to see 50 or more pairs of skis in front of M.J. Gray's store while miners and their wives were inside buying food. Every mining camp had a ski carnival during the winter. They included jumping, skiing, backward skating, speed skating, barrel jumping, figure skating, and tobogganing. Truthful James is a guy writing in Scribner's Monthly, and here's what he said about tobogganing, 1887 in the Gunnison country. I sat down on the innocent looking cushioned board on the top of the hill. There was a handsome young woman sitting in front of me on the same board, Gad. I had no, no sooner settled down than she picked up my feet and legs and put them under her dainty arms. It was a new sensation to me. I have hugged beautiful girls and been hugged, by, but never from that end. <laughs> I rather liked it. After my surprise, had worn a little threadbare. But while she was uh, holding my feet, and a tingling electric sensation was rapidly absorbing my system, 
An unfeeling brute shoved us off at the top of the hill and we fell, I think, 10,000 feet in a second. It don't take long to think if you are scared into it by the imminent fear of death. I thought of everything I'd ever done that was wrong and everything I'd ever done right. I kept on thinking like a house on fire and shivering on an arctic gale until we reached the level and went scooting across the prairie like an express train. Then I felt better. I saw light before me again. I yelled and shouted like mad. I whooped and bellered as though a tobogganing was something fun. A hell of a ride. <laughs> Starting in 1881, the tour races were held in the Gunnison country. <laughs> in advance, racers would come into town on a Friday and they would set the course, there are no gates, set the course, and then they would draw the heats. All of the skiers who came in skied in from 15, 20 miles away, or if they were lucky, they could ride the railroad in from Gunnison. And then the race would be on Saturday, and they always had heats for the races. In 1884, one mile north of Crystal, at the little mining camp of Snowmass City. Anybody been downtown Snowmass City? Pretty prosperous town. A heavy fall of powder snow led to wild shenanigans. After dancing and drinking after the race and listening to Arkansas Bill and his violin, the tipsy miners had a snowshoe party sliding down the hill without guide poles and actually jumping over cabins. Gunnison country skiers were proud of their expertise, and they looked down on other camps. Some were asked in 1886 what they thought of the order barring guide poles at the Silverton races in February. The Gunnison men declared that the race must have been down easy, an easy slope where no jumps could be gained. Quote, it would be impossible for any racer to make 20-foot jumps made at the Gunnison races and regain equilibrium while descending at an incline of 45 degrees without a pole. Our experts think they could find girls in Gunnison that would make a better run than those Silverton fellows boast of. <laughs> Let me tell you this. With Allison Gannett, Jill Matlock, Wendy Fisher, Janet Antrim, et al. They could probably find enough girls in Crested Butte to whip any of the guys' asses. <laughs> Did Wendy Fisher win the seven hours of the resurrection? No. She tied. No. No. 54 she runs, they said. She came in second. Yeah, her time was a little Well, she told me that she was not feeling good. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. And I put money on her. I'm going to have to talk to Wendy. No, I didn't. <laughs> In the Gunnison race of January 1886, skiers came down a very steep incline and raced for 500 yards with 20-foot jumps every 100 yards as an obstacle. Tremendous falls were the order of the day. Anybody know where they were skiing? North of Gunnison? Craner Hill, 500 yards, 20-foot jumps every 100 yards, straight down, straight down the damn hill. In Crested Butte in 1881, racers with 9-foot long skis raced right through town on a flat surface for 500 yards in something resembling an eastern sprint. It looked like a mob reminiscent of the tour races at the Berkey Binder or the Vassalopet. I'd love to see that again. I think we ought, to, we ought to have that. We start them up on the hill above Joe Rosman's lumber mill, and we take them all the way down into the high school. First guy wins. Wouldn't that be fun? 100 racers. Mass sprint. The greatest race in the history of the Gunnison country, and one of the greatest of all time, written up in the Kotorowski Hall of Fame at Vail, 
was the race that occurred on Washington's birthday, February the 22nd, 1886. $20 first prize, $10 second prize, $5 third prize, and every racer paid a dollar entry fee. The course was on Gibson Ridge and measured 525 yards. Now, I looked at that coming in today, and I think this is right. 35 degree slope, 250 feet of flat down below, and then you crossed the railroad tracks and continued into the flat until you stopped. Ski trains came in. Denver Rio Grande ran a special round trip rate of 50 cents. Heavy crowd came in. Thousand people minimum, drinking, gambling, cheering for their champions who had come from every town in the Gunnison country. The odds on favorite was Al Johnson. Never been beaten. Newspapers said, Without a doubt, the most graceful snowshoer the Rocky Mountains has ever produced. As a daring adventurer on skis, he is noted. And of course, he was the legendary mail carrier between Crested Butte and Crystal. Heats were held to decide the finalists. And the winners of the final four heats were the following. Al Johnson from Crystal, Albert Fish from Irwin, mining engineer, Harry Cornwall from Irwin, mining engineer, and Charlie Bainey, 16-year-old lad from Crested Butte, newspaper said this, he had almost always been raised on snowshoes, and for perfect control of his nerves and muscles, he could not be surpassed. So there we have it, top of Gibson Ridge, 1,000 people down on, nothing more dramatic could ever be in the Gunnison country. And all four men on the top, Newspaper account, turned their backs to the racers, went off to the side, and put their favorite dope on the bottom of their skis, their favorite wax. Guy stood on top of Gibson Ridge and fired a rifle shot. And when he fired the rifle shot, all four men took off. Johnson, of course, never been beaten. All four took off the top of the mountain, and about halfway down, Harry Cornwall hit a bump and went off to the side, and he is out. Albert Fish clipped a stump and is out of the race. And now, and you know how to write in those days, the newspaper account said of Charlie Bainey, the light, nimble little fellow doubled himself up on his shoes and shot down the mountain like a speeding bullet. I believe that Charlie Bainey went into the first racing tuck in history. Al Johnson's mother did not raise a dumb kid. Al Johnson saw what was happening. He too went into a tuck. And as they passed the finish line, at a speed estimated, if, you know, if we know the time and the distance accurately, approximately 60 miles an hour, Charlie Bainey was 18 inches ahead of Al Johnson. And they roared into the flat to be mobbed by the crowd. And then went into Crested Butte, into the local drinking establishments, and a wild party was held and bets were paid off. The most dramatic race ever held in the Gunnison country, and the second most dramatic race would need a telescope to see it. In Gothic, of March of 1886, a dozen skiers skied a 635-yard course off steep Gothic Peak. Frank, Crystal, Frank Williams of Crystal flew down in 23 seconds to win first prize at 25 bucks. When the tour races of 1886 ended, the Gunnison paper declared, the people have been introduced to a new and novel sport and will become very popular. Captain Edward Bunn of Gothic, I don't know if I gave this to you last time or not, if I did, don't worry about it, I'm just going to take a second, was a real innovator in skiing in Gothic. He did away with the guide pole in 1887, replacing it with a contraption he called cords, one of which is fastened to the tip of each ski. Did I tell you about that last time? Yep, forget it. 
The winter of 85-86 was the peak of Crested Butte ski carnivals and races in the Gunnison country. The boom was over. Mines closed up, silver price dropped, railroads ran less, investors stopped coming in, and the good times were all gone. I took the liberty, if I can read this, because it's a small print. There's a great song that exhibits what happened in 85, 86, sung by Neil Young. How many people remember the song, Four Strong Winds? Maybe three. Four strong winds that blow lonely, seven seas that run high. All these things that don't change, come what may, but our good times are all gone, and I'm bound for moving on, and I'll look for you if I'm ever back this way. Think I'll go out to Alberta, weather's good there in the fall. And it continues on and on. The good times were all gone. And the ski races kind of came to an end. The Elk Mountain pilot in January of 1888 said, What has become of the snowshoe clubs? We believe that with a little effort, a race can be gotten up. In February of 88, a race was run at Crested Butte on the 22nd with six contestants and good prizes. In Irwin, in 1893, a race was held at Irwin, 1,600 feet, and the winner was Charlie Bainey, who ran it in 17 seconds and won $50 prize. Bainey may have been the best there ever was until 1938. And you got to wait a few minutes for 1938. The great days were over because of reasons I've already given. But some guy came up with a, quote, flying sled about 1890. And here's the newspaper description. The flying sled, which A.O. Brooks is working out, seems to be a success. Although he has not yet gotten powerful enough motor, and of course the machine should be more substantially built to stand rough usage. However, it flies. When the motor is speeded up and the snow surface is good, it skims over the fields at 50 miles an hour clip. Even sizable hills are handed with ease. Soft snow is better than hard pack, for the faster it goes, the less it, it outs. Just as skis, and the good snow gives better holding surface. In commercial use, the drive will have to be equipped with an adjustable knife blade, for on smooth road or crust, the rotating blades of the propellers are inclined to give it that tailspin effect, which is so dangerous with aerial planes. First snowmobile in history, flying sled, propeller on the front, not a problem with it were two. Number one, when you got it in six inches of snow, it didn't have enough power to pull forward. When you got it on the flat without any snow, you never knew where the hell it was going to go. You couldn't control it. It was all over the place. A great invention went a-glimmering. Now, where I'm from in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, I got a good friend. He's a little older than I am now, Bobby Hennessy, a fellow Belgian farmer. Uh, they race snowmobiles on Lake Michigan, on the ice, little ice and snow, 70, 80 miles an hour. Scared the hell out of me just watching them. And then they got a turn, not at 70 or 80. It looked like NASCAR. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And that was 60 years ago. The lean years, 1900 to 1930. When the silver miners left, that was it. The population went way down after 1900. Then came Western State College. Colorado State Normal School started in 1911. Two-year school. Twelve years later, 1923, became a four-year school known as Western State College. And now you got a whole bunch of young people. And right in back of the present football field is a hill called Smelter Hill. And what they used to do was 
get on a toboggan on top of Smelter Hill and a half mile run went right down Smelter Hill, right through where the College Center is today and all the way down to the President's house on Ohio Street. Very fast, tobogganing. Quote, the sagebrush had been covered, the scenic drive in the end had been buried, and Smelter Hill was a smooth white surface suggested of bob uh, toboggans and skis. A number of toboggans were broken, repaired, and they soon increased from one to ten. After you have tried a toboggan, the first thing you want to do is get on a pair of skis. And there are always plenty of students willing to hand you a pair and give you a start. You feel about the same on a pair of skis as you do on a toboggan, with the exception that the ski on one foot is inclined to go directly opposite from the one on the other foot, and the first thing you know, you land head first in a snowbank. The ski hill was referred to locals as zip and walk a mile. <laughs> zip and then trudge back up to the top. In the late 1940s, Western State College put in a rope tow on Cupolo Hill. The engine was a 15 horsepower gas Buick engine and a 1500 foot rope with some government supplies left over from World War I. The Cupolo Hill rope tow held four to five people at a time and later got night skiing with lights put on by the city. So next time you're in Mountaineer Bowl and you look up on that hill right behind Mountaineer Bowl, Imagine a 1,500-foot rope tow with five people on the rope at a time and lighted for 12 years. I don't know if I asked this the first day, but I will soon move around the room and ask everybody, one at a time, of course, everybody get their shot, to name the 12 ski areas of the Gunnison country that had lifts. You got one, Cupolo Hill. Most of the skiing during this 30-year period from 1900 to 1930 involved getting the mail, skiing to and from school, skiing to catch the railroad, and getting into town for supplies. For recreation, skiing was carried on in Crested Butte, Tin Cup, and a lot of the other towns. One of the ski hills that Crested Butte people used to ski is one mile up the Slate River in a place called Chicken Ranch. You guys know where that is? Chicken Ranch. And there they built toboggan jumps and you know they walk up and ski down. In Taylor Park, one of the greatest skiers ever, Nobody ever heard of this guy. He's the equal of Hal Johnson and maybe better was Alex Parent. Canada, Wisconsin to Colorado. From the year 1880 to 1918, Alex Parent carried the mail alone in Taylor Park and here was his route. St. Elmo, we all know where that is, St. Elmo on the east side of the divide. Over 12,200 foot high Tin Cup Pass into the town of Tin Cup, all the way to the Pitt Taylor Park Trading Post, no trading post, but by the current trading post, to Dorchester, up over Taylor Pass at 10,800 feet, down Express Creek into Ashcroft and into Aspen. That was his route on skis in the wintertime, three-day trip, just camping out, legendary guy, often lost, often touched by avalanches, always cheated death. The formative years, 1930 to 1950, with the start of the Depression in October of 1929, the Roaring Twenties had come to an end. I always tell my classes, the Roaring Twenties, ladies and gentlemen, is a misnomer. They were roaring for the upper 1% of the population. They were terrible years for the other 99%. Edna St. Vincent Millay, 
coined a phrase for the 1%, the great Gatsby. My candle burns at both ends. It will not last the night. But ah, my friends and oh, my foes, it gives us such a wonderful light. Burn that damn candle on both ends. Live it up. You're not going to live as long, but you're going to have a hell of a lot of fun while you're burning that candle at both ends. And she also said something that all of your grandfathers and grandmothers appreciated in the 1930s. Remember I talked to my classes, I said, when you go home and you talk to your grandmother and grandfather who went through the Depression and World War II, the first thing you tell them before you say anything is thank you, because your ass wouldn't be here without them. Willa Cather, the end is nothing, the journey is all. In Upper Michigan, we call that letting the wind blow through your hair. You got to relax now and then. Let's take a look. Right across from Cement Creek was Quicks Hill. And at Quicks Hill, Mr. and Mrs. Quick were ranchers. Western State Hiking and Outing Club, led by Clarence Rockwell and Abe Capron, would come with all their students, 30, 40 of them at a time. And they would walk up that hill and then ski down, and then some continued up and went to the top of the mountain and skied down. And there, in 1938, a guy by the name of Carl Easterly, who just, I just talked to Carl about two months ago, he died about a month ago at the age of 94 in Silverthorne, an 18-year-old high school student, had a jump build on Quicks Hill, and he was doing backflips in 1938, long before Stein Erickson ever even thought about him. Not only was he doing backflips, he was also featured in 1946, an early TV program, being pulled by a helicopter, jumping and flipping over a wooden fence, skiing 100 yards across a pond on alpine skis, flipping over another wooden fence and making it. Now, whenever I told that story, I would always say, and I think Carl will probably be able to hear us, I, don't, I hear all these hot shots, Swan Dyke and, and uh, Wendy Fisher and all the other great skiers of the area. The greatest of them all was Carl Easterly was doing more than anybody was doing. So I want to have everybody right now give Carl a round of applause. I told you I'd do it, Carl. I hope he's up there. That's where the skiing went on then, on the other side of the road from Cement Creek. Mr. and Mrs. Quick, great people. They loved the college kids. They'd have hot chocolate for them, coffee for them. She'd make rolls for them, cinnamon bread for them. You see these kids, you know, they got black under their long skis and off toboggan jumps. Fred Brand, I got a great picture. You'll see it next week of a guy coming off a toboggan jump at 35 miles an hour, seven feet in the air and rising. And two guys watching him are scared as hell, and he's scared as hell, and he's wearing a flying helmet. <laughs> and, and Fred Brand, the guy in that photo, told me, he says, we're always scared to go off that damn jump, but nobody wanted to be called chicken. So we all did, and fortunately, they all survived. That's one area. Another area that opened up was Monarch, 1939 as a WPA project, Monarch Ski Area, celebrating 76 years this year. The city of Salida hoped to become a winter sports area. They installed a rope tow and a log lodge up the pass and from that small start, the modern Monarch ski area has evolved. The rope tow went up one of the most famous runs in Colorado. You can still see the cabin down below and the flywheel down below. When I talk to my athletes in New Zealand, ex-athletes in New Zealand, they always say, the first thing they say is, Coach, Coach, skied the gun barrel. Gun barrel yeah. The gun barrel, ladies and gentlemen. A gun barrel, one of the great fall lines you could ever get to. Not long, but it's steep and it's a straight shot down. 
Tickets were a dollar for the season and 25 cents a day. The lodge was called the Inferno. And it was called the Inferno, I-N-N, -N, because the mayor of Salida was Claude Ferno. The Inferno. Parking was along the highway. 75 people a day skied on weekends and holidays, and the outhouses were in the trees. In 1959, the Monarch Winter Sports Area was incorporated, and in 1960 came a chairlift. Sven Wick used to have uh, his skiers ski up there, alpine skiers. In 1962, I'd just come to the Gunnison country, and I got to know some of the students. And Mike Zaradka and uh, Mickey Landers and, and Mike Burns said to me, say, Van and Bush, we're going up to Monarch to ski on Thanksgiving. Want to come? And I said, yeah, you know, hell, I'd never skied before, but I said, I'm a reasonable athlete. I'll be able to handle this. And I would bought a pair of skis, head standard skis, and boots and head poles, I don't know what the boots were, for $80 from a business professor named Mike Maddox. Never been on them. So I'm in the lodge, and they got these double lace boots, and I got to watch the other guys to figure out how to put my boots on. And then I had to watch people on the outside how to put the damn bindings on. You know, they had the cable in the back. Now, to this day, I do not know how I got from the lodge to the Garfield lift. I must have walked. And I get on the lift, and they're way ahead of me. It's about 10 to 10. And I'm riding up that lift, and I'm all alone on the lift, and you can't see where you get off. And I say, well, you know, the only thing I can think of is they got a bunch of straw out there. When you get to the top, you jump into the straw. So I get to the top, and I, I, so I, I see what's happening. I ski. I knock two women down right off the bat. Now get this. This is a true story. I got on top of the uh, Garfield lift at 10 o'clock on a run today that would take me three minutes at 10 of 2. <laughs> at 10 of 2, I arrived at the lodge. 50 yards and crash, get the, you know, the long thongs. And... So anyway, I'm sitting there having a beer, and I said, well, you know, there's no way this will ever, I'll never be able to ski, because I was sitting back, you know. <laughs> Two of the girls in my class named Judy Fields and Barbara Stone came down that mountain, and I said, by God, if those girls can do it, I'm going to do it. So I learned how to ski on the side of Mountaineer Bowl, a guy named Glenn Cress. And I don't mind saying that I was probably the worst in the class. But I paid my dues every Tuesday and Thursday after class. And on the weekends, I was at Crested Butte. J-Bar. Graduate to the T-Bar. And then came that magic day that I rode the gondola up. And I get to the, near the top, and I thought, oh, my God, what the hell are those little hills? <laughs> Moguls. Another year, <laughs> figure out how to do the moguls. I'll tell you the other classic story. Our assistant ski coach, a guy named Jim Bodbard, who is a ski meister, four-way skier, top one in the United States. I'm skiing in his head standards, and I told uh, Bombard one day, I'm going down to Leo Klinker's spot on uh, Crested Butte, and I'm getting a pair of master, headmasters. And he said, Van Bush, don't get masters. You, you're better. You're ready for the comps. I said, the hell I am, I'm getting the Masters. So I get a pair of Masters skis, never skied on, I'm walking up to the ski shack, you know, the gondola shack. Bombard's going up there with the ski team. He's got about four pairs of skis. And he, he said, Dad, I told you. To he said, what size boot do you wear? I said, you know, 10 and a half. Bombard takes a pair of head comps that he's got, gets my foot in, gets me all set. I go to the top. I'm on head comps. When I get to the bottom on those head comps, I said to myself, I will be in the Olympic Games of 1964. <laughs> They're unbelievable. I was skiing on a pair of junk, you know, no, no uh, edges practically. Those head comps were sensational. My skiing improved 50%. He was dead right. So I got to go down and see her father, Leo Klinker, and I say, Leo, I have never skied on these master skis. Could I try? Oh, you don't worry about it. We'll sell them. <laughs> never skied one run on them. Comps are some of the best skis I ever had.
Where was this shop located? Right near Whitey Sporsich's house, right? No, but didn't he have one in Crested Butte, too? It turned into our house. That's where we, that was originally the Gorsuch shop, I believe. Oh, the Gorsuch shop. Okay, maybe it was, yeah. yeah. And that's on Elk Avenue. Yeah. yeah. All right. We're getting there. In 1939, the WPA also financed the Gunnison Ski Course, right where Antelope Hills is, just to the west of Gunnison. Nobody ever skied it, but it had a rope tow, and that's another ski area that we had in the Gunnison country. Another one I'll just tell you about quick like is 1962. Craner Hill opens up, and still opens up for the young kids as long as we have enough snow. The crowning achievement came in February and March of 1938 when Salida and Gunnison hired a ski train to take people up to the top of Marshall Pass. 477 people rode the train from Salida, 117 from Gunnison, and 122 rode the regular train. And when they got to the top of Marshall Pass, Thor Groswald of Winter Park, Count Dupuy from Belgium, we're up there to give lessons. And people tobogganed and they skied, and they skied down to the Chavano switch, where the railroad was waiting for you. And then you could, for 10 cents, catch a ride on the railroad and go back to the top. The maximum runs of the day were three. You get three runs all day. Some people went up at nine. The skiing ended about four. And then they sat in a heated section house with no lights for the regular train to come at 7 o'clock. Famous Marshall Pass ski train. The rise of the, how are we doing on time? 8.05. We need a little break here. Three minute break. Let's take a three minute break and we're coming to Pioneer. People have been very kind. Folks, here we go. Uh, I have just been told, and I, I didn't recognize we have a celebrity out here. <laughs> Jimmy Faust, the winner of the Al Johnson, the winner of the Grand Traverse. You racing this year? Yeah, retired. retired. Several times. All right. I should have been talking about him along with the rest, so I apologize. <laughs> yeah. The only reason I know about it, he came up to me and said, what about me? No, he didn't. He did, he did not say that. He did not say. <laughs> you, you were a multi-time winner. How many times did you win the Johnson and did you win the Grand Traverse, Jimmy? Uh, three each. Three each, yeah. huh? Yeah. Wow. With the competition that that was. Pretty impressive. You still ski? Oh, yeah, I skied Gothic today with this gentleman here in the green shirt, John Barney. <laughs> you skied Gothic? Yes. Gothic Peak? Yes. Which side? Uh, the west face. So you skied down to the road sure, there back sure, there, huh? Yes. Wow. Elston. Yeah, Washington Gulch. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I'm impressed. How was the snow? Crusted. Crusted, yeah. In 1938 and 1939, World War II beckoned. And the storm clouds began to gather, and things were going to change in the ski industry and all over the United States. And there's a, a great song. I was going to read this to you last time. But it's most typical that I read it at the end of the 1930s when things were changing. It's called Those Were the Days. I think some of you may remember the song. Once upon a time there was a tavern where we used to raise a glass or two. Remember how we laughed away the hours and think of all the great things we would do. Those were the days, my friend, we thought they'd never end. We'd live and dance forever in a day. We'd pick the life we'd choose. We thought we'd never lose, for we were young and thought we'd always have our way. Then the busy years went rushing by us. We lost our starry notions on the way. If by chance I'd see you in the tavern, we'd smile at one another and we'd say, and then the chorus, those were the days. Just tonight I stood before the tavern, 
Nothing seemed the way it used to be. In the glass I saw a strange reflection. Was that lonely woman really me? Those were the days, my friend. Through the door there came familiar laughter. I saw your face and heard you call my name. Oh, my friend, we're older but no wiser, for in our hearts the dreams are still the same. It's a great song. And a lot of people were probably, if it was written at that time, would have been singing it at the end of the 1930s because nothing would ever be the same again, including skiing. At the end of the 1930s, Monarch had started. At the end of the 1930s, the Marshall Pass ski train had begun. At the end of the 1930s, they were skiing up on Quicks Hill. And then came the war. In late 1939, before the war broke out, three people from Gunnison and one guy who had just moved in from Aspen, Art Fordham, Wes McDermott, Chuck Schweitzer, all got together and they had been used to walking up hills and skiing down. They'd go to Grand Mesa on the weekends. But now they decided Art Fordham had moved from Aspen and he lived at the Pioneer Guest Cabin. And every, in the summer, he walked that whole area and Art was a great skier at Aspen and he thought this had the makings of a terrific ski area. So he got together with the three Gunnison locals, and during the fall of 1939, they had a dream of starting a new ski area that would be called Pioneer. They cleared trees. They got a Forest Service permit. They had a contest to name the runs. And one lady got the honor of naming all the runs, the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, and Milky Way. And the name of the lift would be called Comet. The first chairlift in Colorado history was at Pioneer. An aerial tram was taken from the blistered horn mine near Cumberland Pass, not far from Tin Cup. When these guys were there to, to get the buckets and the cable and everything, they couldn't figure out how to dynamite the towers. And an old miner, he ran into an old miner, and the old miner said, if you give me a little time, he said, I'll get some dynamite from my cabin, I'll show you how to do it. And he took dynamite, and he placed it carefully right next to the towers, and he blew them, and these towers just fell right over. Perfect. And then they put all the towers on the back of an old truck. Later on, they put the cable on the back of an old truck, and they brought it to Cement Creek. And he had so much weight on the back of the truck that seven guys had to sit on the front of the truck. Otherwise, everything was going to just bottom out in the back. And they brought it up to Cement Creek. The towers were reworked into the type needed. The one and a half inch cable was spliced. And a 400 horsepower motor provided the power. Forest Service observed all of this saw that the chairs were 20 feet above the ground, and they said, you know, you guys got to lower the damn chairs. If people fall out of those chairs, they're going to get killed. This is in the fall of the year. Then tremendous amount of snow fell, and now people were riding those chairs with their knees under their chin and were being flipped out of the snow and out of the chairs. So the Forest Service said to the locals, you know, you guys got to Got to get those chairs a little higher. People are going to get hurt. <laughs> it was always funny when Wes McDermott used to tell me that. The chairs are made out of the harnesses from the huge ore buckets, which are part of the tram. The buckets were taken off. Steel frame that held a wooden seat was welded to the harness. Seventy chairs were used on a 6,100-foot-long tram. Pioneer opened up December 1939. Ran from 9 to 4.30. 30 dollars $30 for a season ticket, $1 for a day ticket. Pioneer was very steep. If you stood on top of the Big Dipper, towards the bottom of the Big Dipper, and, and one top skier said, and spit, it would go all the way to the bottom. Just a sheer drop. On the drop-off waterfall near the bottom of the Big Dipper, one man said, My God, I forgot my parachute. 
A jump was built for one year in 1946. In February of 48, Joan Trumbull got out of control and hit the timing shack at high speed. She suffered a severe concussion, a broken leg, and a dislocated ankle, and her skis penetrated the wall of the plywood shack and moved it six inches. Now, I've skied Pioneer a long time ago, people, when they are little saplings, and I'll tell you, it's a tricky area because every run is a fall-away turn. You guys ski, ever ski that? Yeah, so, so did I, backcountry. I wasn't around 1940 if I was to ski it. My God, not that old. Oh, this is not funny. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, especially on the Big Dipper, everything's like this or like this. You're never coming down the fall line. So it's real easy to get out of control. And of course, they had a lot of great collegiate races there, and people from all over the West came to ski at Pioneer because... It was the only chairlift in the West. That was it. Legendary area. Um, the area lasted until 1950 and 51. By then, two things had occurred to end Pioneer. Number one, it had become very unsafe, and the Forest Service probably wasn't going to give a permit out. And number two, there was another area being built about four miles up the road to the north. And that was Rosman Hill, and that would replace it. But right around the same time, in the late 40s, in the early 50s, as all of you people go up the lower loop, and you start walking, and Jay and Karen O'Neill's house is on the right. That used to be uh, the, uh, the steakhouse, Mrs. Erickson's steakhouse. Right on the other side of the road, you see that steep shot coming down. That was the Pershing Mine Hill, where the Pershing Coal Mine was. If you keep going further up, then you come up to Peanut Lake and the Peanut Mine, and then, you know, you kind of keep going all the way to Gunsight Pass on the mountain bike trail. And there, local people, led by Frank Storica and Chick Mufich and Chuck Songer and others, Crested Butte Ski Club, got together and they put in a rope tow and a jump. And that is where Steve Krismanich and John and Jimmy Gibson learned to ski, and they're tremendous skiers. If you go to Flatirons in, up on the mountain, Osmondson and Santelli, they got a picture that I got from Steve before he passed away. And Steve Krismanich is skiing on, uh, skiing on the Pershing Mine Hill with the heavy baskets and the long, longer skis and, you know, the bear trap bindings. And, I mean, it's the most amazing turns I've ever seen. I mean, it would make people proud today to be skiing around the gates like that. And all the Crested Butte locals skied, and that area lasted until the early 1950s. And now, Western State Ski Team was looking for another area to ski at. I mean, Pioneer was going to be phased out. And they're going up towards Crested Butte one day in 1951, and one of the skiers named Dolph Coos, who later on became a ski coach at Fort Lewis College and was a United States Olympic ski coach, looked out the left side of the window and supposedly said, there it is. And it was Rosman Hill. And our ski coach, Sven Wick, went over to talk to John Rosman. He said that John Rosman was a tremendous person, and John Rosman agreed that the Western State Ski Team could lay out a couple of ski runs and maybe even a ski jump at Rosman Hill. Rosman Hill was one of the top ski areas in the state, and it opened up during the winter of 50 and 51. Two rope toes, a jump, a judging stand, and when you see the slides next week, it's unbelievable. Because as you come in from Highway 135, the cars are parked all the way to the, where they had a little parking lot. And then you look on 135, and the cars are piled up all along the road 135. They had tremendous numbers of people that came to watch. Buddy Werner, Barney McLean, Crosby Perry Smith, some of the greatest collegiate racers of them all, and the United States ski team. Because that's where the United States ski team came from. 
The guy who built that jump was a, a fellow by the name of Frank LeFay. Frank LeFay was given 12 hours of academic credit, independent study by our athletic director, Paul Wright, and he got help from the ski team every weekend, but he's the guy who really did it, and he got all A's. <laughs> Never went to class. His job was building the ski area. And he probably should have got even more credit for it. Sven Wick went on to become a two-time U.S. Olympic coach, father of Nordic skiing, and he and John Rosman became great friends. When Sven Wick came here in 1949, he came in from Sweden, and he couldn't speak the English language. And Western State just lost their ski coach, and uh, one of the guys that he knew in the United States said, why don't you go to Gunnison and, and apply? Well, Sven came, and Paul Wright couldn't communicate with him. And he said to Crosby Perry Smith, the United States Olympic skier, he says, communicate him by hand gestures and, you know, see if he's worth hiring. Well, Sven Wick was on the Swedish Olympic gymnastics team. But the war came and he couldn't compete. So when Sven gave a gymnastics expedition in the gym, Paul Wright hired him on the spot. And Sven overlapped me by five years. I came in 62, he left in 67. Turned 94, just had a big birthday party for him last uh, two weekends ago. Skis four kilometers a day every, uh, every two days, 94 years old. And here's how I regard him. I, I say, Sven, when I knew you and we overlapped, I said, if I could be half the teacher, half the coach, and half the person you are, my life would be complete. And I said, Sven, I'm not there yet. I'm only halfway there, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Never get there. One of the greatest men I've ever met. And he was a ski coach. Rosman Hill had two rope toes, had a smaller, lift, uh, smaller, uh, smaller rope toe, a ski jump, a very fine cross-country course, a tower for jumping judges, a warming house, a volunteer ski patrol, and during intercollegiate races, hundreds of cars would be lined up. The winter of 1960 and 61 was the last for Rosman Hill as an alpine area, although jumping and cross-country races continued after. A lack of money, limited facilities, and the coming of the big one, Crested Butte ended the years at Rosman Hill. Now, at the time, in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, people, you could count all the ski areas in Colorado practically on one hand. Monarch, Wolf Creek Pass, Berthoud Pass, Winter Park, Ajax. No, not Loveland. Well, Ajax. That's about it. About five of them that had lifts. So the age of skiing was about to dawn. And coming in, I always say, the big man cometh. Coming into Crested Butte in 1961 was a guy named Dick Eflin. And Dick Eflin was an Air Force pilot from Germany. And he had been told about Crested Butte by a guy who had worked in Crested Butte who was in the service with him. So he's driving up, and Dick tells me as he drove up and he looked at the Elk Mountains, he said, yeah, this looks just like the Enns Valley of Austria. And he kept driving, and he went up to the uh, Matt and Rudy Malensic Ranch at the base of Crested Butte Mountain, and he asked the Malensic brothers if he would be allowed to walk on top of the mountain. And he brought a guy in from Aspen. I, the guy's first name is Art. I never can remember the last name. One of the top ski area builders. And they walk on top, right around Crested Butte Mountain. And this guy called Dick, told Dick Eflin, this is one of the three best ski mountains I've ever been on. Dick Eflin came down. He didn't have any money. But his fraternity brother, Fred Rice, did have a lot of money. From grain elevators to real estate companies, et cetera. And they bought the ranch from Rudy and John Malensic and started the Crested Butte Ski Area in the fall of 1961. And the first winter it opened up was 1961-62.
And you've all heard the story about the blessing of the gondola. This was January 63 that the gondola came in. The first year they had a rope tow and a T-bar and a J-bar. That was it. Second year to get an Italian gondola. And Catholic priest Leo McKenna's brought in to bless the gondola, which immediately broke down 50 yards after it got out of the shack for the day. And then Father McKenna slipped in the parking lot and fractured his kneecap. That's when Vandenbush thought maybe of uh, converting to a Protestant faith. As I visited the priest, I said, this was not good form today, Father McKenna. This is not good at all. Here are some of the things that I remember about Crested Butte. I came here one year after it opened. Uh, right off of the bat, it got in financial trouble. You know, I mean, if Dick Eflin had known the odds against this, I mean, he's a visionary. I got a lot of respect for him. He never would have started it. And it went into bankruptcy, and a guy named Gus Larkin ran it for the Kansas City banks. And then in 1970, the Callaway family bought it, and they owned it in 2004 and sold out to the Mullers. And the Mullers owned it for a while, and I think they're just running it for the uh, company out in Florida right now. But here are some of the legendary things that went on. I remember the local people working there. John Galowitz, John Krismanich, Johnny Panyon. They worked at the area. I got a chance to know those guys. A ski patrolman named Jack Hudson, every Saturday while people were at the beer stube, which used to be one of the Malensic buildings, right at the bottom of the T-bar, would come in, the snow was piled up to the roof, and he would come right on top of the roof and jump over the roof and land in the parking lot. And you could hear the roof, you know, up on the housetop, click, click, click. We all thought it was St. Nick around Christmas time jumping over the roof. Then the powder skiing on the North Face. In the early years, there were only, you know, I'd say 10 to 15 of us that were skiing on the North Face. We would get off the gondola. And of course, to get off the gondola, you know, you got your skis in the gondola. You take them, put them on, wrap the long thongs around, and then we would go as fast as we could right down that road to Upper Paradise. As fast as we could. And then we would kind of skate. And then after we ran out of skating, it's sidestepping to the hawk's nest. And from the hawk's nest, we would ski the first bowl and about half of the second. And we'd come out on half of the second, and we'd ski to about uh, the lower part of Keystone. And from there, we would take a run that was to the right side of today's Houston. And we would arrive on the top of the Panyon Lift today, Gold Links Lift. And then we would, this is all powder now, and then we would ski down to the East River Road, right down past that lift today, and then we would skate back over, all powder. No bumps. And when Walt Disney made the movie, The Snowball Express, we skied right by the building, which was no building, it was just one, <laughs> one wall. That's all you saw, it wasn't a complete house. And then I, I would get up once in a while early in the morning and I'd ski with the ski, uh, get up with the ski patrol because I knew all those guys. And I was working on my book. Now, now get this. They finally caught on, though. Uh, we would go immediately after their meeting at about 8.30. We would go to Spellbound and my favorite place in the world, which is the Big Bowl, Phoenix, Phoenix Bowl. And I would say, guys, let me go ahead and I'll ski down to the bottom and I want to take some pictures of you guys coming down. <laughs> you get it? Oh my God, the skiing was fantastic. They never caught me. They all wanted to be on camera. <laughs> I still love Phoenix Bowl. Uh, and then, one time, Ten of us, this is 1969, uh, in February decided, and it was uh, ski patrolmen, ski instructors, myself, a couple of college professors, we were going to ski down to the Veltri Ranch. And we were screwing around, and we didn't make it to the Veltri Ranch. It was about 1.30 in the afternoon. As you go out of town, you see a big ravine coming off of Crested Butte Mountain. And it ends 500 feet from the valley floor. 
That's where we were, the bottom of the ravine. So we had to climb all the way back up. They oh, were very embarrassing. Ski, uh, the uh, snowmobiles are looking for us down in the valley. They ran the chair for us of the gondola. We got back up at 1030 and were taken down. Try skiing in the dark sometime. Very bad form, very bad move. <laughs> Two guys by the name of Tom Leroy and John Hoffman were doing flips in the early 1960s right at the base. And then came the legend. How are we doing on time? Plenty of time. <laughs> then one, one more story. Then we come to the legend of a man named, I'll talk about him later on, named Garth Hammond. Garth Hammond was a Western State College student. And Garth Hammond liked to party a little bit. And one day off of Tower 7, I mean, he came off of Tower 7, where Michael Grazier did a triple flip one time. And uh, he got up, you know, it just shoots you right in the air. He's probably 50 feet in the air and it looked like somebody shot him with a rifle. And he just came right down and ruptured his spleen. Took him to the hospital, okay. The next year is Flauschink, end of the ski season. I'm skiing with my buddies Bartleson and Prather. We are at Keystone Park. And up on Jokerville, they got 500 people on either side of the hill watching, and there's, a, there's a gates set and there's people coming down. So it was a hot day, and I told the guys we'd put our coats off to the side. So I'll grab the coats and sidestep up. You guys go on up. So I grab the coats, and I'm sidestepping up to the bottom of Jokerville. And I see this guy come down, and the crowd is going crazy. And I'm looking at this guy, and I say, he's not doing anything fantastic. I don't see any fantastic turns. But the closer I got to the bottom of Jokerville, and the farther he got down to the bottom of Jokerville, I found out he was nude. <laughs> it was Garth Hammond. And he got to the bottom, and he fell. And the guy with his clothes now is running down Jokerville. You ever see this movie like the Keystone Cops that speed it up? This guy's running down and he falls. And Garth Hammond's shirt, shorts, socks, air, all over. Anyway, to make a long story short, Garth Hammond is arrested by the ski patrol and is now in the back of a sheriff's car going to Gunnison, and arrested on indecent exposure. Handcuffed in the back. En route to Gunnison, a note comes over the intercom, the radio, that a guy has stolen a car in Gunnison. He had headed up to Crested Butte. Be on the lookout. About Jack's cabin, where the Span Ranch is, the sheriff sees the guy coming with the car, turns his lights on, the guy runs his car into a drift into the, the side of the road and runs out into the, the Kenny Span's field. Now get to it, wouldn't happen today. Garth Hammond says, if you take those handcuffs off me, I'll go get that guy for you. <laughs> sheriff takes the handcuffs off, Garth Hammond runs into the field, grabs the guy, the guy is now in the back of the car in handcuffs, and Garth Hammond is riding shotgun next to the sheriff in front. <laughs> Newspaper report comes out on Thursday. Local hero captures thief in field. Not one word about indecent exposure. <laughs> about seven or eight years later, I'm in the Cattleman Inn having a beer. Garth Hammond walks in with a suit and a guy next to him sees me at the bar, walks up to the bar, and he says, hey, Van and Bush, he said, uh, don't tell any stories. He said, I'm now selling insurance and I'm respectable. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, slideshow, we're out of here. <laughs>